Hey guys, welcome back. So for this one, we are getting into Ultimate Invasion, which is not exactly the return of the 1610 universe, but nonetheless, it looks like Jonathan Hickman is tossing us a bit of a curveball, but he's good at those. So I'm excited to see where this goes. And also there's a lot of thoughts that I wanna share about this one. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. Alright, so when we jump in, we begin with what appears to be a heist, with us seeing this group of four geared up and hopping out of this white van, and as they make their way in, two of these guys are having this back and forth, with it sounding like one of them knows the plan inside out, and the other guy just kinda got yanked in at the last minute, cause the leader of this group just told the new guy that they're going in through the front door, which sounds like the dumbest plan ever, until the new guy sees the leader firing this high tech gun, and all the returning fire bouncing off of a shield that's being produced by his gear. So right away, we're being shown just like the new guy. Somebody's backing these dudes with some insane technology. And to take it a step further, the main dude out of this group, he throws a black hole grenade, which sucks up a bunch of turrets just before it collapses on itself. To where next, they split up to find someone with a key card. And the new guy ends up finding this lady and taking hers, while the leader, he's asking this other dude who has a key card as well. And the guy asks, what does he think he's doing? What is it that you want? And the group leader steps away, saying a billion dollars, which right away confuses this guy because he's like, this isn't a bank. And in response, the team leader says, we know, and he just pops the guy. But as the crew goes on to enter the elevator, the new guy's then like, wait, because he didn't know the payout was a billion. So he's like, hey, should not be getting a quarter of that. But the team leader's just like, dude, you ain't find the job, you ain't playing the job, you agreed to 10 mil yesterday, and that's all you getting. And I can't help but to imagine that one of the other two, the two who know what to do here, are just listening to these numbers like, wait, wait a minute. But at this point, they've made it to the container that they're looking for, and they type in the code to unlock it, which just happens to be 1610. And when I saw that, I was like, man, who is the guy that works here that came up with that number for the combination? Like that dude wouldn't even try. But as the crew makes their way inside, we quickly find that their mission was to come here and break out the maker, the diabolical Reed Richards of Earth 1610 who's a guy that we haven't seen for quite some time. Because the last time that we talked about the Maker was during Venom Beyond, when he took an accidental trip over to Earth 1610, which has me thinking that there's gotta be a story later on that bridges that moment over to this one. Because as it stands, we still need the story of how he got here. However, with this team doing their job, with getting to the Maker to break him out, they give him his clothes, and the Maker's like, okay, first things first. And the leader of this group is like, yeah, first thing, where's our money? And the maker responds with this very cryptic statement, with him saying that it's where all money is, floating in the ether, awaiting summons from an imaginary state to a more believable fiction. And with hearing that, right away, group leader is like, man, I sound like he ain't got it. And to him, it doesn't make sense that this guy could do all these things from prison, but he couldn't get himself out. But for the maker, it's not so much about breaking out of this prison but rather he needs to get out of here without people knowing that he's gone, not until he's ready for them to know. But with saying this, the maker goes on to tinker with this device while going on to mention during the time that he was locked up here, he had been seeing a number of therapists in rotation. And over the course of 37 sessions, he was eventually able to break down his therapists and convince them to go get this guy and his team to come get the maker out. So the maker recruited them, they recruited the team, and now the team is here before the maker. But just before the maker elaborates on that topic, he politely asks that these guys remove their masks. And the maker goes on to let them know that each of them were carefully selected by his flock, or in other words, the therapist. But as the maker goes on to say that his flock carefully selected this team, they examined their profiles and their genetics, he then stops mid-sentence and he's like, wait a minute, who's this guy? To where then the dude introduces himself as Jackson, and he's the last minute new guy that we've been talking about this whole time. But as it turns out, the people that the Maker's flock had selected, they were all rounded up and kept in a safe house, but then one of them freaked out, left the safe house, and died in a car accident an hour later, which was likely the flock's doing. But with hearing this, the Maker lets them know that the genetic sequencing was planned for the original four with each and every ingredient being what makes for a good soup. But with the maker having a lot of time on his hands lately, he already planned for the overlap. And he says that this will create a less than 1% anomaly that most people wouldn't even notice. 
And in response, the guy's like, man, it was the last minute. He did the best he could do. And this causes the maker to elaborate a bit more on his therapist and really just one of them in particular because one of his therapists encouraged him and challenged him to be a better man with better goals which in a way is like us getting the heads up on the maker taking his game to the next level and with them saying this he activates the device that he'd been setting up this whole time and as it turns out this thing fuses the whole team together in a very painful and grotesque metamorphosis which compiles the four of these people into a double of the maker just without the scar and a lot more drool because again the maker doesn't want anyone to notice that he's gone at least not until the first stage of his plan is complete and after this we then jump forward to what is about four weeks ago so roughly a week and a half two weeks since the maker's escape and it's here we find both reed and t'challa who have been investigating this for some time now and i gotta say i really like seeing the two of these guys here and not just because how close the two of them are with the two of these guys forming a brotherly bond over the course of decades but also with seeing these guys come here and investigate this together it immediately reminds me of the conclusion of the 2015 secret wars event because most of the time when i talk to someone about the 2015 secret wars event i often hear how how Reed Richards had just saved the day, as if he had done it all on his own. But for me, looking back, I'll always see that conclusion as one of the greatest team ups between T'Challa and Reed, because when the maker asked Reed to unleash his secret plans, Reed told him, actually, they're not my plans at all. Which then took us to how T'Challa was gonna raise this army of the dead, who would follow him because he's the king of the dead, and again. Oftentimes when I have a conversation about Secret Wars, I feel like this is the part that doesn't get the amount of attention that it should. And I say this because I don't think I've ever mentioned it on the channel before. But back at the time when I covered the conclusion of Secret Wars, like six or seven years ago, I intentionally very intentionally made that a Black Panther video because everywhere I turned, the conversation was very one-sided. And that's not to take anything away from Reed. He needed to go after the Molecule Man. They needed to take the power of the Beyonders that Doom had stole. But for me, looking back, I can't help but to see the conclusion of that story as anything else but Reed and T'Challa saving the universe. And I mean, of course, T'Challa birthing the intergalactic empire of Wakanda. But that's enough of my 2015 Secret Wars rant. I got a link down below if you want to take a trip down memory lane, watch the video, and hear what I sounded like before puberty, and also see how that story went into the intergalactic empire of Wakanda. But getting back on track, I had to get that off my chest, because I talked to some people that act like T'Challa wasn't there. But at this point for Reed, he's expressing how he's trying to put this whole thing together in his mind. He's seen the footage, he's seen the explosion, the different buildings coming down. And for him, looking at this and trying to reverse engineer what happened, he describes it like he's trying to solve a puzzle that hasn't been presented yet. And T'Challa tells him that he knows if Reed really wanted to, he could come up with a way to get the answers that nobody wants to give them. But for Reed, he tells T'Challa that recently he's been trying to do better. He's trying to show some restraint and not dance in the morally gray area like he has in the past. And with hearing this, T'Challa's like, well, how's that going for you? And Reed is just like, mm, not well. But then T'Challa discovers by way of one of his contacts that this building was holding a secret damage control node which right away causes Reed to realize why he was getting all the pushback and who this node is supposed to be for. So when they find it and they make their way inside, there's a brief moment of relief with them seeing the maker here, but even still, Reed is suspicious. So he gets closer and he says, are you really Reed? And the thing just says, if you can't tell by now, could you ever? As it just falls back apart into a huge puddle of filthy McNasty. But now this is what the maker wanted Reed to see. This is the moment when he wanted him to know that he'd escaped. And for Reed, he's not as worried about where the maker is as he is worried about what the maker's doing and why. Because it's here where the puzzle begins and Reed is weeks behind. So then next we jump forward another week where we find the maker at the Baxter building where he's able to just walk straight in because to every security measure and even to Reed's own son, Franklin, the maker is Reed Richards. And he strolls in with no issue. Bio scans are checking out, not as much as an eyebrow is raised. And in this moment, though we're not told exactly what it is that the maker is looking at, we'll circle back to this in a little bit. But before we do, we first head over to the necropolis, where we find that this threat has been taken very serious, because we find Reed sharing this surveillance footage with the Illuminati and the original members at that. And I like to think that they'd also gave Captain America an invitation, but unfortunately it slipped his mind. Okay, bad joke, <laughs> but either way, 
while they're all here, we discover that the maker's been busy paying everyone a visit over these past few weeks, with him going to Wakanda and stealing vibranium from T'Challa. He stole Terrigen spheres from Black Bolt. He takes Reed's bridge, which oddly enough was sitting in a Stark warehouse, but I believe it was there because prior to that, Otto Octavius had borrowed it during the events of Devil's Reign for his Superior Four spinoff. And I mean, it's possible that Tony may have taken it to borrow some of Reed's ideas back when he was working on Project Ark, but this just kind of brushes through and it doesn't really go into that and I'm sure Tony's glad about it. But then after this, we then see that the maker had taken the Krakoan gate, which is supposed to be unmovable and otherwise useless to someone without a mutant gene. But nonetheless, the maker was like, I need this. And then next we find that he went to the Sanctum Sanctorum and snatched up an immunity lance. He went to Atlantis and stole some dilution shields. But amongst all of these items that he stole, the Illuminati aren't sure what exactly he's working on. And the thing that makes it even more confusing is the fact that he went out of his way to grab this list of items where many of which seem redundant. And even though at this point with the Illuminati not being sure of what exactly the maker is making or doing, Tony and T'Challa put together the idea that the maker definitely wants all of their attention with each item having a unique signature, which will eventually lead them all to him. But before that happens, later that same day, we find that the maker has taken a little trip to Brooklyn, where he's paying a visit to Miles Morales, which is something that I didn't expect at all. But with how it's done, I'm glad to see it. Because initially when the maker shows up, Miles is like, dude, who are you? And the maker goes on to say that the two of them are brothers. But then he goes on to tell Miles that he had read someone's records about some trick of universal rebirth and reality shaping. And really it's here where I believe that the maker's referring to his recent trip to the Baxter building. Cause it sounds like he went through 616 Reed's records with the maker wanting to know everything that happened after Molecule Man cut him into little pieces as well as any other details that he could find as far as personal notes made by 616 Reed Richards with him composing, if you will, the collaboration between Owen Reese, the Molecule Man, and his son, Franklin Richards, to restore their universe as well as others and distribute them to their respective realities. And I say this because I believe that the maker went through Reed's records for reasons that stretch far beyond him just having the curiosity, but we'll talk more on that in a little bit. But as the maker goes on to tell Miles about him reading through the quote unquote secret history, he goes on to tell Miles that the two of them have something that sets them apart from any creature on this planet or in this universe for that matter, because they are the only two survivors of a dead universe. And I gotta say, like right there, th this makes me want to go on another tangent, because at this point it almost seems intentional, because it's been some years and nobody's talking about James Hudson Jr the son of 1610 Wolverine. And I wanna know why, because he also originated from the 1610 universe and made his way over to Earth 616. He joined X-Men Blue for a while. James Hudson Jr. has been here for a minute. And at one point he even fought Dokken, the son of 616 Wolverine. And Dokken we've seen plenty of recently. He's been on Krakoa, a couple years back he joined X-Factor. Dokken's getting plenty of shine. But James, he's getting treated like a stepchild from an alternate reality because since he met the younger, time-displaced X-Men team and fell in love with the young Marvel girl only to find that she's still in love with young Scott, this broke my man's heart. And as far as I know, at this point, in 2023, after the Venomized event that went down back in 2018, in X-Men Blue, Jean let James down easy and she told him that she'd only seen him as a friend, to where then he had taken off, needing time to figure things out, and then a few issues later, he popped back up to stop Sebastian Shaw from attacking Jean and Scott. But that was it. That was the last we seen him, with him more or less expressing that he's gonna leave Jean alone, he respects her decision, and he's just gonna leave it at that. But yeah, that's enough ranting on James Hudson Jr. If any of you guys wanna recap or just follow his entire journey, I got you covered there too. But yeah, I gotta admit, when the maker said this to Miles, the first thing that jumped in my mind was, you sure about that? But with the maker coming here, to see Miles, he's come to let him know that he's going back to their home universe. And at first, Miles doesn't believe him, but he then quickly comes to realize that the maker is serious. And he tells Miles that he came here to ask because it would have felt wrong to go without inviting Miles to come along. And for the maker, if things were the other way around, he would have wanted this invitation as well. But then Miles just looks at him and he's like, nah, I'm good. And when I first read this, I laughed so hard. Because in the 1610 universe, life was terrible for Miles. And even though it's not perfect here on Earth 616, in comparison, he's much better off here. But even with Miles declining his offer, 
the maker gives Miles a card that appears to be blank and he tells him to take it in case he changes his mind. Which right there has me thinking this card's gonna be pretty useful in the future. But just after this the maker leaves to where next we find him being confronted by the Illuminati. But even with them catching up with the maker at this point, again, this is what the maker wanted. Because with Reed yelling that he's not gonna get away with this and they're gonna stop him, the maker's more or less like, I doubt that because he set his course and made sure that as soon as he passes through the bridge, it'll randomize so he can't be followed. And to decode it, it'll literally take years, probably even decades. But before the maker steps through the gate, he tells them that he's going someplace he can call his own, someplace he can create as was intended at his creation. And with him saying this right there, Reed knows what's happening. So he tells the Illuminati that they've got to stop him now while they can. So right away, all of them just unleash on the maker. But with everything that they throw at this shield, it does nothing. And to where then the maker's just like, y'all finished? Like, is we finished or is we done? But then as the maker steps through the gate, he tells Reed why he had orchestrated this whole puzzle to make sure that Reed would find him just before he went through the gate. And he asked Reed, letting him know that he's always wondered if Reed could do it again. Would he erase him from existence? And for hearing this, Reed, he takes a second, but he responds by saying yes. And before the maker steps through the gate, he says, I'll keep that in mind. And now with the maker gone, the Illuminati is just sitting there with no clue of where the maker went or what he's up to. But as we continue into the epilogue, we find ourselves on a school trip with Peter Parker and Liz Allen in what appears to be the 1610 universe. And lucky for us, we arrive at the moment where Peter's life is about to be changed forever as he's about to be bitten by a radioactive spider. But then nope, this event is prevented by the maker with him stopping this Peter Parker from becoming Spider-Man. But with the way that this is done and it appearing to be Earth 1610, the bomb is dropped on us that this is actually Earth 6160 with the maker taking the events of this reality and changing them in the ways that he sees fit which is a plan that i'm sure he has a more efficient way of executing on a larger scope but also with us seeing the maker do this with the title of this story being good artist copy and the title of this epilogue being great artist steal i believe that the maker wants to be what 616 reed richards was at the end of 2015 secret wars and the maker wants to take the 1610 universe and make it his own and who knows how earth 6160 is gonna look all right so when we jump back in we pick up on earth 6160 where at this time the maker is going through his memory log which is a database that he's built containing the records of what he's changed and the status of specific people in this universe which he's augmented. And though we were shown prior to this, the example of him stopping Peter Parker from becoming Spider-Man in this universe, at the time I had mentioned that there had to be a more efficient way for the maker to go about this in order to see this through, which for him there is, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But the question that remains with the maker coming to this world and altering it throughout time is what world did he originally come to and make this one out of? Because as it stands, we're not really given any information that ties this to where we last saw the maker before this event began. Because back in Venom issue 26, when the maker inadvertently returned to his home world, Earth 1610, at the time, it was like our second confirmation that Earth 1610 had returned. But as it stands now, none of this is being acknowledged and it could just fall in line with everything that Hickman's been saying lately as far as ultimate invasion being its own brand new thing so on one hand it could be Hickman just completely ignoring what Donny Cates had set up or on the other hand this could just be setting us up for a huge plot twist down the line with us discovering something like the maker just had really bad memory <laughs> who knows but I say this because as it stands we'll just continue to go forward with ultimate invasion and fingers crossed it will explain at some point why the maker invited Miles Morales to return home with him if all this truly was something completely new. But I also bring this up because the way that this starts with the maker thinking back about his last conversation with 616 Reed, the maker remembers asking Reed if Reed had the chance, would he erase the maker from existence? And like we saw when Reed said yes, the maker said he'll keep that in mind, almost as if that conversation influenced some of the changes that the maker made in the process of molding Earth 6160. Because we find out amongst these changes, he delayed the launch that the Fantastic Four would make so that they would avoid being caught in the cosmic rays that would have made them fantastic. And like I mentioned before, the maker has a memory log where he keeps up with the status of all the different heroes of this universe, where in the case of this world's Reed is tagged as controlled, and all the other members of the Fantastic Four 
are deceased. And going forward, we discover that the Rainbow Bridge is broken, isolating Asgard, which is ruled by Loki as the king of Asgard, with Thor taking a knee. But also, as we're shown these changes, we're told that some things are just going to happen. Bullets are going to be fired, bombs are going to explode, mankind is still going to be a slave to their nature. So even still, we get Bruce Banner eventually becoming the Hulk. But for the maker, even with him adjusting events throughout time, he still finds missing pieces of history that seem impossible to not be there. As we're shown Captain America not being found in the ice. Which really for us as the reader, it's like our first taste of witnessing the maker having trouble in paradise. And going forward, we find that Stark Industries is actually a company called Stain Stark, which is ran by Obadiah Stain and Howard Stark, with Howard Stark being Iron Man which is a huge departure from both Earth-616 and Earth-1610. But we'll discover with time that the Maker has specific intentions for the use of Howard Stark since he's listed on the memory log we were shown under the status of Controlled, which we'll also learn more about in time. But at this point, Obadiah pulls Howard to the side to let him know that he's got to get out of the lab and show that billion dollar face to the world by attending this huge premiere that the Maker is holding. And as it stands, Howard already promised Obadiah that he would go. And for a moment, he expresses to Obadiah that there's times when Howard thinks about his gifts and everything that him and Obadiah have accomplished together. And he wonders, is this it? Is the world as it is the sum total of what he's capable of? And he asks Obadiah if that makes any sense. And Obadiah responds more than he can imagine. And from here we find after a four hour flight, the two of them make their way to Latveria for the internationally televised opening of the city, which has been shielded in isolation for two weeks prior. And at this premiere, there were many big name appearances because aside from Obadiah Stane and Howard Stark, there's also the legendary and immortal Hulk, who under the maker's control is now more of a monk who is a testament to the power of serenity and the epitome of those who resist the seductive call of rage and vengeance. And aside from him, you also had the Harada Yoshida, as well as the Rasputin family in attendance. But early on in this premiere, we see the maker look up to the sky and say, well, I'm waiting, letting us know that he's anticipating what was pretty much a surprise to everyone else. Because as soon as he says this, the sky opens up and a litter of Avengers variants just comes pouring out with different Captain Americas, Thors, Wasps, Visions, like a superhero duplication glitch gone mad. But through the course of this attack, the maker is shielded and unusually calm. But while under fire, Obadiah asks Howard, if he brought his portable suit, but Howard says no, since Obadiah told him not to. And it's here we find, with Obadiah not taking his own advice, that he has a suit, and he suits up, which for us is like the shock factor reveal that Obadiah Stane is War Machine. And I gotta say, I'm digging the 6160 War Machine suit, which possibly is because it has the whole 1610 vibe to it, but yeah, just wanted to get that out there. But as this chaotic fight goes on, we see Magic, Omega Red, Colossus, everybody's in on the action. Even the Hulk, with him having the holy man protector of peace thing going on, so it's not like he refuses to fight, but he'll fight to protect his people and as a last resort. But amongst this chaotic battle, of which the Maker's just standing back and watching, as if he's AFK, tragically Obadiah Stane is reached through from behind by one of the Visions, who delivers a fatal blow causing the War Machine suit to go critical. And as Howard rushes towards Obadiah, there's nothing he can do as Obadiah just says I'm sorry to where next his War Machine suit overloads and detonates, knocking Howard Stark back and out cold as this battle continued all around him. And sometime later, Howard finds himself woken up by the Maker, who first gives Howard the news about Obadiah's death just before showing him that he has the surviving attackers captive. And the Maker goes on to explain to Howard that all of them are from the future, sent back on a temporal kamikaze mission to erase the Maker and possibly Howard Stark from history. But then next, the Maker goes on to tell Howard that he uses data here in the city on cellular legacies after doing a regressive scan on each of these soldiers. And with that information, he gathered together their current day ancestors to order their extermination so that by cause and effect, the future superhero attackers would have never existed. Which on one hand just had me like, man, that's nasty. And then on the other, yeah, I mean like, well, who was down here related to Thor? Just chilling. And on the third hand, would Vision turn into people juice? Or would the lack of Wonder Man just make him fall over? Hey, who knows? But for Howard, with him seeing this, he flips out and he tells the Maker that whoever did this, they're gonna erase him next when they find out. But the Maker goes on to tell him that that's not going to work because he wasn't born here, not in this place, on this planet, or even this universe, because he emerged here 
fully formed. And if they come for him, it'll have to be at the height of his power. And with hearing this, as far as Howard's concerned, these people did. And for that reason, his friend is dead. So the Maker tells Howard to follow him because he wants to show him something. And just after this, the Maker reveals to Howard an Immortus engine, which immediately after, Howard begins to critique the construction. But with seeing that the Maker has a time machine, he tells him this has to be the reason all those people came back and that the Maker has to destroy it. But as it stands right now, the Immortus engine is damaged, currently non-functional, and the Maker wouldn't destroy it even if he could. And then the Maker tells Howard to look around him at this perfectly ordered society that he lives in. And he asks him if he believes if this is how things were supposed to go. And the Maker goes on to tell him that he used this machine to remake the world into how it is now, erase the threats before they could emerge, and repurpose existing pieces like Howard Stark himself for grander designs. And for Howard, given this information, he's immediately thinking about the repercussions. So he tells the Maker that he has to understand the full scope of what he's done, annihilating the future, destroying their past. This won't be the end of it. This is just the first encounter. But the Maker just tells him no. This was the second. The first was two weeks ago, as he then removes his helmet, showing Howard Stark that the top half of his dome is gone, while telling Howard that he's the one who did this to him. And for Howard, with a very exhausted expression, he asked the Maker, dude, how are you not dead? Which for the Maker, he was able to survive this because a long time ago, he moved parts of his brain and his vital organs throughout his body for the sake of preservation. But this injury has caused his memory to be impaired, flawed, fractured, so as it stands now, he can't trust his memory because there are some things that he's recalling incorrectly. But he goes on to let Howard know what he's sure of is that he needs him more than anyone else on this world and maybe on other worlds because the maker believes that Howard Stark is the one who built this Immortus engine, which now not only reveals to us the maker's main intent and use for Howard Stark, but also it introduces to us the huge flaw in the maker's memory, which could be hiding critical details even from himself. All right, so starting this off, we begin at the funeral of Obadiah Stane, which takes place just days after he was killed in the insane attack in Latveria, which was targeted at the Maker. And at the time, we talked about these multiple visions, Captain Americas and Thors, and how they were sent here from the far future. And that's something that we'll dive deeper into in just a little bit. But here at this funeral, we pick up with Howard Stark and his son, Tony, where after the service, the two of them have a conversation that I believe is going to play a huge role later on down the line. And maybe way, way later, depending on how you look at it. But while they're here, Tony tells his dad that he's sorry about what happened. Because this was just terrible. Because he knows how close his father and Obadiah Stane were. So Tony goes on to ask his dad, what is he going to do now? And it's interesting how Howard's initial response, it's really just him asking his son Tony, what if he told him to pack his bags because they're getting on a plane so they can run away and live a very quiet, small, and peaceful life, which is something that Tony thinks is amazing. But he tells his dad, like, that's not going to happen, is it? And Howard just says, no, it's not. But then Tony goes on to let his dad know that he saw the attack on the feed, but then they cut all the coverage. It was a total blackout, nothing for an entire day. And then suddenly his dad showed up with Obadiah's body, which now causes Tony to ask his dad what happened in Latveria. So from here, Howard tells Tony what happened over there just two days ago. Where following the attack, he was approached by Emmanuel DaCosta, who on Earth 616 is the father of Robert DaCosta, Sunspot, who inherited his wealth after his father was deceased. But here on Earth 6160, he's very much still alive, which just falls in line with a lot of what we'd seen here. Howard Stark being a prime example. But going around the room, Howard sees a number of others, most of which he only recognizes names and faces. But Howard doesn't know them too well, because before, Obadiah used to do all the meeting and greeting. And as it turns out, Howard kind of had a crash course on this when he tried to speak to Yoshida, who at a first glance, you might want to call him Sunfire. But on Earth 6160, he's the Sun Emperor, and he doesn't speak to anyone when he has the mask on. And if Tony knew the protocol, he would have known when the Sun Emperor is wearing his mask, you can only communicate to him through his voice, the Viper. And going around the room, you have Ra, who only speaks when the sun is out. And the inverse is true for the moon of Khonshu. And next, Emmanuel introduces Howard to Henry Duggery, the Captain Britain of Earth 6160, who has both the Sword of Might and the Amulet of Right. So I guess that man just told Merlin and Roma, let me get both of them things, which makes him more powerful than most Captain Britons. But as they're having this conversation, magic storms in 
demanding to know who was behind this attack. And she tells everyone in the room that they all need to get things rolling so they can go after whoever did this. And with magic going on about getting everyone together and going after their attackers, this confuses Howard because as far as what he knows and what's public information, the Rasputins are the enemy. And at some point in time, everyone in this room has been at odds with the other. And he even goes on to give them examples like the Eastern conflict, the event in the Pacific, the winter apocalypse. And he asks like, should he go on? But the Hulk tells him that he promises, however it might appear to the world at large, there are no enemies in this room. And he lets Howard know that what he's perceived is the world as he knows it. But the truth is, amongst the seven territories represented by the people in this room, each of them will play the part of the quote unquote adversary, just as the Rasputins do right now. And over time, each of them will take their turn. While in the other territories, their citizens have something else to focus on with their eyes constantly on external threats rather than the people in each territory focusing on internal failures. And everyone else in this room agrees with the maker on upholding this plan for the greater good. And right there, Howard Stark was just like, wait, wait, what? And he tells him that this just might be the most insidious thing that he's ever heard. But the Hulk just goes on to tell him, to be fair, not all of them agree with such universal assumptions because he believes that some people are capable of achieving a state of inner calm, much like he's done with him devoting his life to it. But most people are incapable of maintaining that state in perpetuity. They can't handle the quiet. They can't let their action be inaction. They can't maintain serenity with all of the hysterical babbling that surrounds them. And it's something that the Hulk tells Howard Stark that he wishes wasn't true as the maker steps in saying, but it is, and it always has been. And the maker tells them, of course, focusing on the shortcomings of mankind's nature makes it easier for those in this room to gloss over the other major reasons we do this. The little people hate us, we giants who rule the land. It's not how it used to be in the ages gone. Back then it wouldn't have mattered. The powerful would just roll right over the powerless if need be. We could build an empire on their bones if we wanted. But now they are a collective, instantaneously aware of just how many of them there are and how much they uniformly hate people like us, which is why it's necessary to give them something else to focus on, which we've gotten very good at doing. But with the maker giving this brief monologue, Howard is just more or less like, yeah, that's worse. And he tells the maker before he got here, he said that he found all of this to be insidious, but now he thinks that was just too kind of a word. And the maker tells him, that Howard can choose whatever word he wishes, but it won't change who they are and who he is. Because Howard Stark, rich, brilliant, and powerful, he is one of them. And Howard tells him that it doesn't feel like it, but he does have one question. So the maker's like, of course, ask anything you want. So Howard asks if all of this, this well choreographed dance is to keep the people happy so that they can get on with the important work that giants do, then would he mind letting him know what that work is? which now puts a smile on the maker's face because he's like, hey, now you're asking the right question. Now we're getting somewhere. But before we continue what happened here, we go back to the present day. Two days later, in the same conversation between Howard and Tony, and now with Tony being filled in on this portion, he asks his dad, what's he gonna do? And Howard is very honest. He just tells his son that he doesn't know. There's too many variables for a definitive answer. The scale of it literally reaches across the globe. So he asks his son, Tony, if he has any bright ideas. And Tony pauses for a minute before telling his dad that he thinks he should fight them. But Howard believes that that would only prove some people's point. And then there's the small issue that he might lose. But his son, young Tony Stark, he's very passionate about resolving this. So he tells his dad that there's right and there's wrong. And this is wrong. But Howard just lets his son know that he's mistaking right and wrong for good and evil. And Tony asks his dad if he believes that Obadiah knew about all this. And Howard tells him that he doesn't know. But he'd like to pretend that Obadiah didn't know so that he can remember Obadiah as the man he thought he was because he knows that he'll never get a real answer to that question, at least not from Obadiah. And he's not exactly sure if he wants one. And with Tony just looking at his dad, Howard asks him what? And Tony tells him, you should fight them and win. And as their helicopter arrives at the pad, where Howard is getting ready to take the Quinjet back to Latveria, he tells Tony that he's still processing what he's learned and that he does have some ideas that are getting closer to the edges of where he might start. But he asks Tony to give him a couple weeks before he's just disappointed in his dad and give his old man some time before he figures out what he's going to do. And Tony lets his dad know that he can help him. But as Howard goes on to board the Quinjet, he tells Tony 
The point of the exercise, the reason why I would even want to fight and win is so that you can outlive us all. But I promise if I need you, I'll let you know. Which from there, Tony's just like, okay, before he calls his dad one more time and he tells him to be careful, only for Howard to tell him, that's not how it works, son. Careful doesn't come with winning, which are words that I believe Tony's going to remember for quite some time. And now with Howard going back to Latveria, we now jump back one day, back when Howard was still in Latveria, when the maker took him inside the city, where Howard asked the maker, where are they? Only for the maker to ask him if he's never been inside the city. Because with the maker already having stepped out of time and traveled through time, he should know this. But because a portion of his brain's missing, with the rest of it scattered throughout his body, like we saw in the previous issue, the maker doesn't have all of his memories quite together yet. And as they continued, the maker took Howard to what's considered to be the darkest corner of the city. And the maker's honest with him. He tells Howard that this is more of a prison. But he brought Howard here to show him who he's going to be working with, who's a person that some would say is the smartest man in the universe. And this person is Earth 6160 Reed Richards who the maker now has as Dr. Doom, which in a way explains why they're in Latveria. But also this provides a little more detail to what we were shown in the maker's memory log, where we saw Howard Stark marked as controlled, as well as Reed Richards marked as controlled, which still has me curious about the death of the other three members of the Fantastic Four, because I still want to see that backstory. But also with this reveal, it gives us a brief look into the maker's response to 616 Reed's answer in issue one, when the maker asked Reed if he could do it all over again, would he erase him from existence? When at the time, Reed said yes, and the maker told him that he would keep that in mind, which now just seems like the maker's doing that in a more allegorical way. And from here, we then head into the far future, where the multiple Captain Americas and Visions and Thors came from, where we see one Cap saying, 4,000 years of careful genetic engineering was all for nothing. Despair and the end of all things was before us, but we did not yield. To where then one of the Thors says, now we have 6,000 years of better stock, righteous blood, and your armies have been replaced. How longer must we wait, master? How much longer can we wait? As a hand goes up, silencing them. As this figure goes on to say, do you see how he hides? In this game we play, I, ageless and immortal, in real time, my adversary, a creature of a temporal vault, a time thief, if there ever was one. And what do we say of all pretenders? As they respond, their time will come. So the figure says, tell me of my legions. As the others then say, they are infinite, they are immortal, they are ready to die. And lastly, this figure tells them all, this pleases me, it makes me eager. I have heard your cries, I have heard you ask me, Kang, is it time? And so I tell you truly, the time is now. As the Kang of their future is revealed. And though we're not specifically told who this is, 4,000 years in the future, with 6,000 years of better stock, wearing his Iron Kang suit, I can't help but to think that this is either Tony Stark, or at least a product of what he did in an attempt to help his father. Because in other cases, we've seen Kang be a descendant of Reed or of Doom. And I want to say on Earth 1610, we got a story where Sue Richards from an alternate future based on theirs became Kang, which by the time this goes up, I'll have it linked to the end of the video. But as it stands, I don't think Earth 6160 Reed is getting those kind of visitations. And not to mention, at the time that a majority of this story is taking place, Susan Storm is deceased. But I don't know, it's still a bit too early to even say who this actually is. I just wanted to tell you guys a couple things that were crossing my mind. But all will be revealed in time. Alright, so to start this out, we're diving right back in where we left off when the maker brought Howard Stark to the deepest section of the city to meet Earth 6160 Reed Richards, who would be Howard's assistant while he's here building the maker a new and mortise engine, since the last one that the maker used to manipulate the timeline of this world was damaged. So after this, sometime later, with the maker leaving Howard to work alone with his assistant Reed, 6160 Reed, who is also Doom, starts to tell Howard, I know secrets, <laughs> which is funny to me for some reason. I guess it's the way he's doing it. And at first, though Howard is more focused on getting this done, he more or less works to a stopping point before asking Reed what kind of secrets does he know. So Reed tells him, neither one's whispered, nor murmurs of the discontent, or rumors that take the root and become true. No, these are the best secrets, the sins the great maker holds deep in his heart. Which then has Howard like, okay, I'm listening. And then he leans in to tell Howard, 
I know where he is from. I know how he made the world as it is now. I have seen it with my own eyes and until now have had no one to share it with. But now I have you, Howard. And after that, Reed leans back asking Howard, do you want me to show you? And Howard tells him, absolutely. But first things first, because when he finishes the Immortus machine, they just might have all the time in the world for that. But also with how this is done, we end up jumping forward some time so we don't get to hear all the juicy secrets. But instead for the time that we are here, we see Reed telling Howard about how the Maker tortured him and how Reed found out that the Maker was listening in during that time. And it comes off like Reed is actually saying that he's gonna show Howard how they can communicate so that to listening ears, it would sound like Reed is just going on and on about information that the maker really wouldn't care if Howard knew. At least that's how it seems, because for us looking in, it's intentional that we miss a lot of this conversation. But as we go forward, the signs begin to show one after the other. Because later we see Howard start getting ready to give the maker the Immortus engine that he'd built. But before he does, him and Reed have a bit of an exchange where now it's clear that they have a plan in place. Because Reed's a bit nervous. He thinks either something could go wrong or this moment could be goodbye. So Howard tells him he understands. He feels the same way, but it's going to be OK. I'll see you on the other side. Which, again, with us knowing that some kind of plan is in place, I want you guys to keep in mind the conversation that we saw in the last issue when Howard had a moment with his son Tony after Obadiah's funeral and before he met Reed, when Howard told Tony about the Maker. Because like we saw throughout that conversation, we had moments like Tony telling Howard that he could help and Howard telling him, if I need you, I'll let you know. But also, back then, Howard told Tony that he has some ideas as far as what he's going to do about the Maker. But he's still getting to the edges of where he might start. Because now, Howard is stepping over that edge and he's taking action. Because it's here where Howard gives the Maker the Immortus machine that he'd built, where we also see Reed taking a letter that's addressed to Tony as he activates his hologram suit and walks out the door, showing us two sides of this plan playing out simultaneously. And now with the Maker inspecting the Immortus machine Howard brought him, he tells Howard, You've built it, the machine that will enable me to do all the things that I've done already, a way to make this world into the wonder that it now is. Only for Howard to tell him, no, I simply copied it, made one of my own, a better version if I do say so myself. Because for the maker who wants Howard to believe that this Immortus engine is going to stop this monster from the future who sent their recent attackers, to Howard, the maker is just as much of a monster. And at the same time that they're having this talk, Reed is planting power conduit terminators that he can remote activate to let down the shields to the city as he makes his way out. And right when this happens, Howard tells the Maker how he's no different from this monster in the future and that the Maker doesn't deserve him, but they deserve each other. As the temporal shield to the city goes down, allowing Kang and his forces to make their way inside, completely violating the Maker's safe space. <laughs> and as planned, Reed makes his way out, locking the Maker inside with Kang and Howard as well. So to defend the city, the Maker sends out the Children of Tomorrow, who from what it seems like, and really just at a first glance, because we're not told much about these Children of Tomorrow, but at a first glance, these guys look a lot like their 1610 counterparts, who the Maker initially put in place for evolution and ultimately world domination. And come to think of it, seeing the Children of Tomorrow here, it's pretty crazy, because it now has me thinking of the dome on Earth 1610, where five minutes for the outside world would be 900 years inside the dome, which at the time allowed the Children of Tomorrow and the Maker to create insane technological advancements like the city, which was an artificially intelligent, self-aware city that only got more advanced inside the dome in the span of 900 years, which again was five minutes to the outside world. And that's not to say that on Earth 6160 that the maker is bringing back all of this here in the same way that he had it before, but I had to mention it after seeing the Children of Tomorrow inside of this city, because the amount of coincidences are just insane. But as Kang's forces and the Children of Tomorrow are just going head to head, the Maker asks Howard if he's decided to play his own game. But Howard lets him know that this isn't no kind of game. He's just doing what he believes he needs to do because the Maker needs to be stopped. And the way the Maker sees it, Howard's being childish and he's acting like the world he just found out about just happened. But right after this, the Maker, he goes for Kang. And Howard's like, okay, everybody's locked in, engaged in their quiet war. All I have to do is, and then bang, he's hit by one of these Thors, followed up by a kick from Giant Man, causing him to fall, dropping the device as a one minute countdown begins for the Immortus engine's critical breach. Meanwhile, over with Kang, 
who we've had quite the conversation about as far as trying to figure out this guy's identity. And unfortunately, we don't get the full confirmation here, but we do get a number of hints that build on top of what we got so far. Cause when Kang and the Maker spot each other, Kang says, I've waited two lives for this moment, and now that moment is here. As him and the Maker clash, like it's Mortal Kombat 1 and the stage is loading. <laughs> and you know when the stage loads and one of them hits the other? Yeah, we get that too, cause Kang bops the Maker on the head so hard that he gets a flashback into the future. And it makes sense here, cause after that hit, the Maker's like, thank you for that. Pain clarifies, and suddenly I remember, I remember you which now takes us to a moment that is in the maker's past, back when he traveled to the far future to see how long the changes he had made would have lasted or if they had eventually become undone, only for this trip to take the maker directly to Kang, with this being the furthest point that he was able to travel to in the future. And at first sight, the maker didn't know what exactly to make of Kang, so with Kang calling him by name and telling the maker that he's been expecting him, this had the maker like for revenge, reverence, what are we doing? Who am I to you? And here, in this moment, which is effectively the past for the both of them, Kang told him, you are my maker, and what you now witness is my origin, as Kang just blasts half the maker's head off, which is what has caused him to have this terrible memory, with this being the moment that he got that wound, that he revealed to Howard Stark back in Ultimate Invasion issue two. But back inside the city, the maker tells Kang, I remember, I know who you are, as a voice from above says, so do I, and I'm putting an end to it. As we see Howard Stark with a device in his chest getting ready to go critical, which has the maker like, hey, hey, what are you doing? As Kang just says, isn't it obvious? He's solving two problems at once. Just look at him. Look at how righteous he is. It's like looking through the fog at some hazy remembrance of what, and Howard stops him right there saying, no, nope. it's like looking into a mirror and hating what you see as he detonates, blasting Kang and the maker, as well as all of their men, as the clock continues to count down and we head over to Reed, who's in the maker's castle, still in Latveria, where we find him taking the original broken in mortis engine while saying, I made a promise, so why do I hesitate? Is it because I have to consider this might be another prison for me? One where the walls are made of obligation and not punishment and all consuming in a way that my previous cell could never be. And as he places the original broken in mortis engine in a case next to that note addressed to Tony, Reed says, something broken for someone broken. Who can say? The choice I leave to better angels. And as he leaves, we continue to see the clock count down from 15 seconds as we head back to the city in the aftermath of the blast where we find Howard Stark crawling out of his armor and unmasking Kang where again we don't see Kang's face all we get is the reaction of Howard Stark which could be interpreted a number of ways as the countdown reaches one with Howard still inside as we see Reed leave Latveria which just has me thinking because this issue is intentionally cryptic with a lot of things but with this being the last that we're seeing of Howard Stark for a while it just has me thinking like had he not run into the complications with Thor and Giant Man when the countdown hit one was he supposed to be on the other side like outside like yeah over the course of time there's gonna be a ton of questions that we're just gonna be looking for answers for as the new ultimate stuff rolls out but after this one week later still in Latveria it's here where we see the Maker's Illuminati trying to make sense of what exactly is happening here. Because with the Maker missing this whole week, they're trying to figure out if this is some part of his elaborate plan to disappear and kill them. They are just completely in the dark. So for a moment here, they talk about what they do know as far as the dome, the city itself, and how it's been closed off this past week. Because at some point before, the Maker told them when it originally appeared and was up for a month, that one month for the outside world was a thousand years inside. And there was a time when the Hulk, for instance, asked the maker before if that ratio of time was constant. So if one month is a thousand years, is three months, three thousand years. Only for him to have the maker smile in his face and say, some secrets are mine and mine alone. Which for a moment, hearing that has these guys all over the place because they assume that it's gonna be two years for it opens up. So they're thinking, do we wait and just keep doing what we're doing or do we just tear it down? But eventually they address the American Union which originally was represented by Obadiah Stane, who's now dead, and after him, Howard Stark, who's missing. So they end up deciding to just split it up to where from there, they take a vote to see who gets what. And after this, we make our way to Stark Tower, where Reed has now given Tony the contents of the briefcase. And he lets Tony know the world was ending, the future colliding with the now. Temporal kings were being overthrown, 
and the multiversal evils were being undone. But bringing these things to you was my most important task. And we find out at this point, Reed and Tony have already repaired the broken and mortis engine. He's given Tony access to secret files and Tony's read the letter from his father. And as it stands, Reed has a notion of where this could go. He sees the suits everywhere. He knows there's potential, but even still, he tells Tony that the choice is his as far as what he decides to do. But before Tony does anything, he asks Reed, is his father dead? But Reed's not able to give him a straight answer because there's too many variables as far as what could have happened back there. So for a moment, Tony pauses before telling Reed, I'm gonna need a suit, which right there just makes me wanna cue some Tony Stark music. Either that or the intro to CSI Miami. I can't tell the difference. So from here, next, Tony puts the Immortus engine that him and Reed have repaired into this next suit while saying it'll need to handle temporal shear and need some kind of integrated navigational control as Reed continues to assist Tony, much like how he assisted his father, while also making suggestions to Tony telling him that this suit should also be a weapon. And as they finish up, Reed asks Tony if he's going to call himself Iron Man after his father, but Tony tells him no. For now, he'll just be called Iron Lad, at least until he's earned a better name, which yeah, gotta say, last time I saw Iron Lad, he found a better name all right, and it was Kang. But I mean, I'm not gonna jump into any conclusions, just reiterating my theory from the last video. But after this, Reed and Tony go forward using the confidential information that Reed brought, which are the Maker's files, to make their way through time into the past to find some of the things that the Maker could not. And as they venture to the past in this icy area, we're shown the letter written by Howard Stark as it reads, My dearest Anthony, I am so tired of this world. I am so tired of the people in it, of what they accept and of what they become. But I know the fault was mine maybe more than most because of my gifts and the means that came with them. I was so wrapped up in the good things I was doing, the work and the bounty that work provided us, that I didn't care enough to notice what was really going on in the world I was shaping. I know now that it is a false, fallen world that we paint as good enough, but under its skin we all know it's rotten to the core. And on reflection, almost all of the things I've made do nothing but support these systems that reduce men and women to pawns and playthings, to workers and consumers, to servants and slaves. All the things I have made are tainted with a patina of evil, all of them but one, and that is you. If this has found its way to you, then I'm gone and I've left you in a world that is no place for the innocent, but only innocent eyes can see it for what it could be. Remember, Anthony, it's never too late to change the world around you. You just have to fight and you have to win. As we see Reed and Tony make their way to find the lost frozen Captain America of this new Ultimates universe, which just has me thinking like, is he going to be like 1610 Captain America? Because if so, hopefully we see him put the paws on Hank Pym again. And I mean, not that I'm instigating nothing, but who am I kidding? I am. And so now real quick, I want to give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all of your support. And for anyone who's new here who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dope spill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts and theories down in the comments below, because you can already tell this is going to be a wild ride. So let's talk about it in the comments until we get into Ultimate Universe. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Now I'll catch you on the next one. All right. Later.